All right. So welcome everybody uh, in the theater here at the Vancouver Aquarium and online. Uh, we are here to uh, convene a session called Recovering At-Risk Marine Mammals by Tackling Pollution. We're going to talk about the problems out there, the threats that they present uh, to marine mammals uh, in their habitat, and then we're going to try to figure out what we can do in terms of tackling the sources, the chemicals, the threats uh, in terms of uh, protecting marine mammals uh, from adverse effect and recovering those that most require uh, our attention through the Species at Risk Act. Uh, it is Thursday morning, May the 21st, and I am delighted to welcome you here uh, for this, uh, this event. I'd like to turn the floor over to Carlene Thomas from uh, Tsleil-Waututh uh, Nation to, uh, to welcome you. Asiam Nitsiaya. I Tanishqualoin, Quitsi, Quitsnala Ihui, Antha Ansahalot, and the Mana Synthaya Eat Siakmak, Slahot Siam, and the Emeth Quath Ansahalot, Quath Slahot Siam, Hait Sapka, Hait Sapka, Meet Sap with Wheelam, Eat Schohopmish, Eat Hamasquiam, Eat Slawata Tamath. My dear relatives and friends, the feelings I have inside are really good to be with you here this morning. And in Coast Salish Protocol, I introduced myself to you with my ancestral name. I carry the name Ansakhalot. And in Coast Salish Protocol, I also shared who my parents are and who my grandparents are. And the reason we do that is in case there's someone in the audience who might know some of my family members. Therefore, then we have an instant connection. We have an instant sense of belonging. My parents are current hereditary chief, Ernie Iggy George. My mother is Deanna George. My grandparents are the late hereditary chief, John L. George. And in the circle of Union BC Indian chiefs, he was also called the Right Honorable. My grandmother is the late Lillian or Dolly George. And I also said to you, on behalf of my friends and relatives of the Squamish and the Musqueam, the Slywiltith, welcome you here to our homelands and waters. My name is Carlene Thomas. I'm from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Tsleil-Waututh in our language means people of the inlet. And it refers directly to the Burrard Inlet and to the Indian Arm, Indian River area. And I just want to share a story with you. It's admirable the work that you're here to do today. I'm really grateful that there are people out there who are taking on this important work because it's we need, to leave, we need to leave a better legacy for our children and our grandchildren and our children yet to come. The story I'm going to share with you is of one of my ancestors. His name was Watsak. He was a great leader of the Slavitith people, and he had a, an infinity. He had a really spiritual relationship with all marine life in the Burrard Inlet. It was said, at times, in times of need, he would make the salmon spawn out of season so that the people had something to eat. And he said, he, it, it was said he could feel things when things were going wrong in, in his environment or in the marine environment, he could feel that physically on his body. And he shared these with his children and his grandchildren and it's been passed down. When he passed away, he, um, our people didn't bury our dead. They were wrapped in cedar bark and placed in a tree. And we have an island that, that's where we placed our highly esteemed people. When Vancouver was becoming a city, our people were moved from our winter village in Tumtmelchten in Belkera, and we were moved to the reserve we're located at now on Dollarton Highway. Our people did not want to leave Watsuk on that island. So they removed his remains from the tree, placed him in a canoe, and as they paddled the waters down the, in, down the inlet to Dollarton, our reserve now, it was said that two blackfish escorted him all the way from that little island 
to the beach just below our, where our current cemetery is. And my grandmother told me that the blackfish didn't turn around and leave. They waited until Watsuk's remains were placed in, in the ground. And once that happened, they backed out and they were never to be seen in the inlet again. There were actually two more occasions that came in. My grandfather said it was when a big tie would pass away, and that was my great-grandfather, James Slaholt, and then when my Uncle Patty passed away. We knew something was, we were going to lose somebody important. The work that the Slaughter people do, oh, my grandma, my grandma always liked to say this part too because uh, her, her father would, you know, sit them around the kitchen table and tell them, tell them all these legends, these stories. And I can't remember which one, a nephew or somebody was making fun. And she said she never saw her, her dad get angry, but he slammed his fist on the table and said, this is not a fish story. I was there. Her grandfather was nine years old and he witnessed this happening. And I feel it's really important to share this story with you because Tzlevatath still has that connection, that shahalmas, that sacred obligation to protect our lands and waters. So as you carry on with your work today, just keep in mind that wherever you're working and whatever uh, sector you're working in, that there are ancient stories that have never been told, or maybe you haven't had the opportunity to hear them, but they are lasting legacies that have been left for a people. So as you carry on with your work today, I'm gonna share this little prayer, then I'll be gone. <laughs> Creator, grandmother and grandfathers, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the circles of families and friends that surround us. We ask you to bless us with open hearts and open minds as we carry on with the work you've placed before us. We ask for blessings upon our families and friends of those who have traveled far to be here. We ask for safe travels for your return home. For these and other intentions we hold in our hearts, we leave with you this morning all my relations. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you, Carlene. Nice warm words and uh, wise words as we look uh, ahead at the next uh, few hours, a uh, couple of days. Uh, but as Carlene uh, reminded us all, uh, we have a job to do, and this is a message we have to take to heart as we go back to our homes, our, our uh, places of uh, recreation, and our work environments. Um, delighted to hand the floor over to, uh, to Lance Barrett Leonard uh, this morning, the director of the Cetacean Research Program, uh, and he will be. Uh, uh, building on the theme that Carlene introduced uh, by uh, talking about blackfish and some of the other uh, uh, marine mammals that we value so much in these waters. So, Lance. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. It's an honor to, uh, to be able to do this first presentation and to have you all here. Without further ado, I'll jump into this. The title of my talks changed slightly from the agenda. Um, actually, what I wanted to say was marine mammals of BC seen through the lens of a pollution nerd. But then I realized it would have to be pollution nerd wannabe because I'm not really. Um, I do other things. Um, Peter is a pollution nerd. So, uh, so we're going to whip through um, uh, a, a very brief introduction to, to, to the species in, in, the, in the province and particularly the ones that uh, we think are particularly susceptible to contaminants. Um, and, uh, and potentially have their viability threatened by them. So the, the, the waters in our province, of course, are, uh, are incredibly rich. Um, they're fed by the, uh, that richness is a product of the nutrients coming off the land and the upwelling caused by the coastal currents. Um, it's a, 
we're tremendously lucky to get to live here, and and so are the so is the fauna that lives off our coast. The uh, the the uh, we're we're blessed with a very rich fauna. Um, we have 25 species of cetaceans in, in the province, including the four la largest uh, that have been cited in BC. Of, of this, about 12 are, are commonly cited of this number. Um, it includes the four largest species uh, on the planet, um, including arguably the largest species that's ever been on the planet. Um, so it's an it's a, it's a st astonishing variety of forms. And we also have, of course, um, uh, pinnipeds, these are the seals and sea lions, the uh, true seals and the, and the eared seals, if you like, uh, five species of those, um, including one that uh, some of you, many of you perhaps have, have not seen, I'm sure you've all heard of it, and that's the elephant seal. Um, and then there's this, uh, this additional marine mammal species that's kind of the outlier, and that's the, uh, that's the sea otter, which was extirpated in the province and reintroduced in the 1960s from Alaska. 14, species, 14 of these marine mammal species are, are listed under SARA, the Species at Risk Act, um, as, at, as at risk. The, uh, the principal human caused threats to marine mammals in, in BC, um, these vary of course from species to species, but if you look through the, the, the uh, species recovery plans, the uh, recovery strategies prepared under the, uh, in accordance with the Species at Risk Act, these, these elements uh, are common to most at least. Prey depletion, fluctuations in prey supply if you like is one, pollutants and spills, disturbance, uh, these would be behavioral disturbance. Ship strikes are a danger to some species. We know about this. There was a fin whale came, ashore, came into Vancouver Harbor on the bow of a ship um, a week and a half ago. Um, an entanglement and bycatch, of course, is an issue. These are human-caused threats, so I haven't listed other, other, um, other sort of natural threats like uh, disease, for example. Prey depletion is often, is circled here, is often, uh, has gotten a lot of attention in recent years, particularly with, with killer whales. Um, and, uh, the, uh, I was involved for uh, last summer in a project to look at the body condition of killer whales um, using, uh, from an, using uh, the shape of the animals as seen from a drone, from a camera uh, attached to a drone, as a proxy for condition. And what we found, um, in a nutshell, among other things, was that uh, there was considerable variation in body condition within family groups of killer whales. So these two animals are brothers. These are two well-known male northern resident killer whales. Um, one on the left is an animal that I'm, I've been familiar with for over 25 years. Um, and uh, you can see this tremendous uh, difference in their, in their condition. These two guys spend their whole, all of their time together. Um, the one on the, on the right is robust. Um, this is the shape that we think a normal healthy killer whale uh, is. The one on the left is, uh, you can see the eye patches actually bending in, is in very, very poor condition. So I, I put this slide up because um, these animals are feeding on the same prey. When we, we know that, that, uh, that resident killer whales in particular, probably others, other killer whales as well, share food compulsively. Um, um, so, uh, so I think it's, it's a reasonable assumption that uh, the, <laughs> the animal on the right wasn't bogarting all the food and starving the, his brother. Um, and uh, so something other than, than simple prey depletion is going on in this case. And of course, the, another uh, uh, well-identified threat to, to marine mammals in the province are, are pollutants of various kinds. And I guess in this symposium, we're not, we're, we're not focusing on catastrophic event, uh, pollution events like oil spills, but rather the incremental effects of, uh, of, of more insidious kinds of pollutants. So one of the things I think is interesting about, about, uh, about marine mammals is we've, we see a couple of relatively recent uh, evolutionary radiations of the pinnipeds and the cetaceans. These animals live in a similar environment and have uh, uh, and have met those their various environmental challenges in a bunch of, of rather different kinds of ways. I've listed a few of those of these of these things these issues if you like here. This is cold water in this province. These are all warm-blooded animals. Thermal insulation is a factor for them. Uh, they've got to eat. They uh, have to have efficient ways to uh, you know to process food to eat it if you like, uh, which isn't trivial in the case of whales. Um, they, uh, their food supply and their environmental conditions change seasonally, so they have to uh, 
they may have to, to move seasonally. They've got predators to worry about. They have different, some of the, the solutions to these issues are things like fur versus blubber for thermal in insulation. For, for diet, um, we have opportunistic and specialist predators in the uh, in marine mammal fauna. We have high trophic level. This is high animals that feed high up the food chain, if you like, and, and others that feed low down, relatively low in the food chain. The feeding apparatus in the case of whales is is diverse. We have the toothed whales and the and the baleen whales, um, and uh, a slight predominance of toothed whales, I guess, in this province. Um, but the uh, there's been a radiation of uh, an evolutionary uh, diversification, if you like, of of these two rather different feeding morphs and killer whales feeding types. Seasonal movements, of course, some species, as as most of you will know, are, are migratory. The majority in in the province here are not. Um, predator defense, I think, is always interesting. Um, John Ford, my colleague at DFO, did a nice little paper with, uh, with Randy Reeves, another colleague, um, a few years ago that, uh, that looked at the risk that most of these animals face. The prince, one predator, they, all but one of them has to worry about is our, 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 predator, our uh, marine mammal-eating killer whales. And uh, if, you, if you run through the taxa, it's fairly clear that animals have strategies for dealing, evolved strategies for dealing with killer whales. They, they fight. If they, they take flight, they're faster, they take refuge, or in the case of killer whales, they're just the baddest mother on the block. So these, some of these factors affect the sensitivity of these animals to, to, to pollutants. Certainly, whether you have a blubber layer um, and have a repository for lipophilic, um, you know, fat-loving, if you like, uh, contaminants um, uh, is of significance. Whether animals feed high in the food chain or low on the food chain affects their uh, their propensity to biomagnify or to accumulate certain kinds of contaminants. Um, seasonal movements affect where, influence where these animals are likely to, to encounter um, contaminants of different kinds. And this is a consideration that, that, you know, I think we have to keep in mind as we, as we over the next couple of days, as we work through this, um, through this process of where these animals are encountering contaminants and at what times of year. Some other, ch some other challenges, or if you like, are sociality. These guys have got to find each other to mate and for other kinds of social functions. They've got to find their prey. They have, as well as migratory movements, there are seasonal movements that they make in search of food, metabolic rates, there are some are high or low, uh, ha habitat issues. So, uh, most uh, marine mammals are somewhat gregarious, um, although we do have some relatively solitary species in the province of beaked whales. Harbor porpoise are rather solitary. Um, they have a variety of techniques for detecting prey. Uh, movements are, uh, some species have rather high sight fidelity. They, they, sometimes this is, often this is seasonal. Um, but nonetheless, you can find them very consistently in the same location for weeks or months at a time. Metabolic rate, some are, are, are energy conservers. Um, uh, so they, say, minimize their energy output, if you like, much of the time, and some are high. This, these are ends of a continuum, of course. And the habitat's off the bottom of the page, so it clearly doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, this is a sort of coastal and of significance from a pollution perspective. It particularly would be whether these animals are, are pelagic, spend most of their lives out at sea, or whether they live in coastal environments. Um, Oh, okay. My circles have moved around slightly, but clearly their movements affect their uh, uh, their propensity to collect uh, contaminants. Metabolic rate, um, it would be another factor um, of, of considerable significance. And, and oh, these are all moved up. Habitat is, uh, is, is clearly a major influence as well. Um, I'm going to quickly burn through the, the species um, that uh, are, are particular focus in this, in this symposium, there are nine um, marine mammal species um, that we think are, are, uh, are particularly of particular uh, concern, I guess, from a, from a pollution perspective. These would, this would include the, uh, the gray whale. Um, this species uh, is, uh, is migratory. It's rebounded from um, uh, uh, dire depletion um, in, the, in the early 1900s. Um, uh, it, uh, Whaling was, was uh, by international convention, was stopped for this species much earlier than for, for the other uh, uh, cetaceans. And it's rebounded, it's recovered rather, rather nicely. Um, 
It's a, it's a baleen whale, of course. Um, it's, it feeds, uh, it, it's a benthic feeder. It feeds on the bottom much of the time, not all the time. Um, so it, uh, it's unusual among, uh, among baleen whales in that way. It scoops up, up amphipods and other invertebrates from the bottom. It also feeds midwater a bit. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it spends most of its life in very shallow water near shore. It's very, very comfortable in shallow water. In fact, it takes refuge in, in, uh, against killer whale predators in, in shallow water. So uh, this affects what it, what it, what's available for it to in, term, in terms of food, and this affects its, uh, its, its uh, exposure, if you like, to, to, to contaminants that accumulate um, in, in invertebrate organisms around the bottom. Um, it has moderately high seasonal site fidelity in the summer. This means that uh, gray whales tend to return from their migration and feed in fairly consistent areas. Um, and uh, it's relatively low in the, on, the, on the food chain scale. This is a, uh, most of the uh, migration of, of uh, gray whales, these animals calve in off Southern California and Mexico, and then travel up the coast, very hugging the coast all the way to the Bering Sea um, every year, the longest migration of any mammal. Um, and uh, so they rarely come into uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Strait of Georgia. This is a, uh, a little map of sightings um, put together by the BC Cetacean Sightings Network here at the Vancouver Aquarium. And you can see that although the majority of the migration goes by, we, we do get quite a number that come into the strait. Um, Boundary Bay, um, just south of Vancouver, is a bit of a hot spot, uh, for example. Humpback whales, um, this is another species that uh, was depleted um, somewhat later than gray whales by uh, industrial scale whaling. Uh, it's listed as threatened. Uh, it's been, uh, it's in the process of being downlisted, but I understand it hasn't been, this hasn't been uh, registered in the, in the Canada Gazette yet, so it's not, uh, it is, it's still uh, threatened, listed officially as threatened. Um, it has recovered, um, it is a bit of a poster child, like the, along with the gray whale, for uh, sort of post-exploitation recovery. It's, it's uh, numbers have, have rebounded significantly. Um, one of the, the, you know, the personal experiences I've had on the coast is, uh, you know, having lived here uh, over 20, 25 years now, uh, was the, uh, uh, is the fact that this species has become relatively common in that time, in my experience. And the first time I saw one, I'd been living on the coast for five years and I was terribly excited. Um, since then, uh, they've, they're, they're uh, in some areas, they're really, they're really quite common. And, um, in the summer months. It is migratory like the gray whale. Um, some, some migrate from, this would be the, the uh, summer feeding area um, in the winter. Some of the population, not the entire population, migrates to either to Mexico or to Hawaii for uh, mating and breeding. Um, they, uh, because of that migration across the, um, the you know, part of the Pacific to Hawaii, they, they're, uh, they would classify as both nearshore and offshore. Um, they spend their time in nearshore and offshore environments. They probably do most of their feeding in nearshore environments, so we don't think that they feed a lot on the migration. Diet is, uh, is they're opportunistic feeders, so they actually feed on quite a variety of, of, uh, even of uh, planktonic invertebrates and small uh, forage fish, pelagic, or um, schooling fish. Um, so these would the fish would include species like sand lance, capelin, um, pilchards, herring, juvenile salmon. Uh, the preferred summer feeding areas uh, are very, there are some real hot spots in BC. It's quite a discontinuous distribution in the summer months. They have uh, there are places where you can go and find humpback whales very reliably, and others where they, that they don't visit much. Uh, so they t they aggregate on those feeding areas, but we think that those are feeding aggregations rather than strictly social aggregations. Um, and they're kind of low to medium on the you know, trophic level. They're uh, uh, they're eating relatively low trophic level fish and uh, and in, in, and invertebrates, as I say. Um, these are again um, these species. Th this species is more common on the uh, on the outer coast and on the central and north coast. But uh, more and more in very recent years, they've been coming into the inside waters of Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia, um, and uh, and visiting Howe Sound from time to time, generating huge revenue for whale watching companies. Um, southern resident killer whales. Um, we list the, the three forms of killer whales in British Columbia uh, as uh, sort of proxy species from a, from a SARA, a Species at Risk Act perspective, they're separate, they're, they're separate units. I, um, I don't think in Canada, we, this isn't something we've argued about a great deal, there's very strong support for this, uh, 
for this separation. These, they really are very distinct uh, entities, if you like, genetically separated, um, behaviorally, ecotypically um, uh, separated. So one, the, first of, the first one is the southern resident killer whale population. This is a very, very small population, fewer than, than 85 animals at present. Um, it's, the numbers have probably all um, been small, been low for relatively small for for a long time. There's very little genetic diversity in the population, but um, but this population size, you know, fewer than a hundred, is is almost certainly not viable in the long run. So the, this population has to grow if it's going to survive. Um, it's a tooth, these are toothed whales, of course, high metabolic rate, non-migratory. Non they do fairly large seasonal movements, but they're not technically a migration. Uh, they spend much of their feeding, their summer months anyway, um, and we think most of their winter months as well, although there's less certainty, in relatively near shore waters. Their diet is strongly biased towards Chinook salmon. That's very much their favorite food. They eat chum salmon in the fall and, and a variety of other species um, in, 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 as a small proportion of their diet. The high site fidelity in the summer and, of course, uh, quite a high trophic level. Uh, Chinook salmon are, are piscivorous fish, so they're already high to start with. Northern resident killer whales, uh, there's about 250 of these. These are also uh, uh, fish-eating salmon specialist uh, killer whales, um, genetically uh, linked to the southern residents, uh, closely related, but distinct. Um, there's good evidence that they, they're, they're culturally isolated, they're, they're uh, geographically isolated most of the time, and they're certainly genetically distinct enough to eliminate uh, much recent gene flow. In other words, there's very unlikely that there's, uh, the matings uh, happen more frequently than once every five or 10 generations at least. So quite separate uh, um, and uh, again, um, a high trophic level uh, coastal critters. Abundance trends in, the, in these two, in the northern residents and southern residents, are, are quite strikingly different. As you can see, the, the southern residents have been stumbling along um, uh, at this very low number, well under 100, for uh, you know for the last three decades, um, and um, and northern resident population has been slowly growing. We 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 could speculate, but it would take way beyond my time limit about why that uh, the northern residents have been have been growing. But clearly, the southern the, the the issues affecting the southern residents are of greater concern. And of course, from a contaminants perspective, the southern residents are spending their time in northern Washington State and southern BC, uh, in the vicinity of three large cities: Victoria, Vancouver, and Seattle. Um, so there's the potential uh, pollutant in inputs for these guys are are uh, substantially higher. Biggs killer whales, uh, this is a term we used to call these transients, we're trying to switch over. Those of us who've been in the business the longest have the hardest time changing, so I constantly flip back to calling them transients, I'm sorry. Um, but this is the population of killer whales off our coast uh, that's, uh, that are marine mammal specialists. Um, and by the way, both the res as the residents have these two distinct populations that are ecotypically similar in British Columbia. There are, there are several transient populations as well. Only one in British Columbia, but as you go into Alaska, at least two more and at least, at least one more in the Russian Far East. Um, there's approximately 250 animals in this population at present. More if you, if you count a, a, a group of, of transient killer whales that are mostly resident of California that appear to be actually uh, continuous genetic populations. If we add those in, it's the numbers closer to 350. They, they are toothed, of course. They have a high metabolic rate like the other transients, non-migratory, uh, largely coastal. And it, it, interestingly, last year was the first year um, in the last few decades since these animals have been the subject of, of focal studies and, uh, and since this whale watching industry has really developed in this part of the province. The first year in that time when there were more sightings of, of big killer whales um, in southern BC and northern Washington than there were of southern resident killer whales. So they've moved into this area um, uh, big time. Their diet is, uh, as I said, is marine mammals. Uh, they're particularly fond of seals, porpoises, um, sea lions, and of course seals have, have rebounded very nicely in, in British Columbia since the, the calls ended in the 1960s. Um, and this is perhaps why uh, big killer whales have, have, uh, have, are responding numerically to that increase in prey availability. Just an idea. Um, they have low site fidelity. These, they make a business of being unpredictable. Um, so uh, big killer whales are, uh, you know, typically show up 
eat a few marine mammals, terrify everything in sight, which then takes refuge. Um, for feeding success drops off uh, and, they, and they leave. And when are they coming back? It could be tomorrow, it could be a month, it could be you know, six and three quarter weeks. Um, so their, their, their business really, their, their modus operandi is, operandum is to, uh, you know, is to show up and, and hunt by uh, using a, a strategy of stealth. So they're the highest trophic level uh, animals uh, in our marine mammal fauna, obviously. Offshore killer whales is the, is the final group. Uh, this is a population that wasn't really well known, is, still isn't really well known, wasn't known at all until the uh, early 1990s. It, uh, uh, as the name suggests, they appear to be mostly, uh, spend most of their time out towards the edge of the continental shelf and the shelf break. Uh, they roam tremendously widely all the way from the southern Bering Sea to, to um, Baja California, or at least the outer coast of the Baja Peninsula. Um, there are about 300 animals in this population. Uh, this is based on, on work that uh, Graham Ellis at DFO has led. Um, th that number is, uh, is a very good ballpark. It's not necessarily particularly precise, but you know, we know that it's not uh, a great deal larger or smaller than that number, to put it that way. We tend to have ex almost exact counts of the other populations, so I add this caveat. Um, it's, uh, it does come into coastal waters from time to time. Its diet includes uh, uh, sharks. We know that, that uh, offshore killer whales feed um, on, on uh, sleeper sharks, um, uh, which is an interesting species that I'll talk about more in a second. Um, the diet is known to include halibut as well. And beyond that, we don't really know what they, we have no evidence that they eat marine mammals. Though. Low site fidelity, as I say, consistent with roaming, and this is kind of medium, medium to high trophic level. This is a sleeper shark, one of the species that uh, that they feed on. These guys can get big, you know, up to four meters, um, and uh, um, they were thought to be scavenging sort of deep water benthic uh, species, the primarily scavengers, until the last ten years or so. And uh, thanks to some tagging work um, done in Alaska, we now know that these animals spend their time going up and down the water column um, to great depths and coming up almost to the surface all day long. And, uh, and, and more recent work also has shown that they are, although they're scavengers, they also do feed on some large prey, some live prey. So they're, they're taken by offshore killer whales um, and uh, numbers of sleeper sharks um, appear to have increased somewhat in the last few years based on, on, uh, on, on uh, long line surveys in Alaska. Um, if you look at sightings of killer whales along the coast, and this particular figure, the blue dots are ones, often we get people report, most, mostly when people report killer whales to us, they don't know what the, which, which population they belong to. But, but this shows clearly that the purple, purple dots are southern residents, they're really spending most of their time in, the, in southern BC waters when, the, um, when people are on the water, which is in the summer months at least. Uh, northern residents are confined to the um, areas north to north and, uh, and and west of that and offshore killer whales have so few sightings that uh, um, as I as I say we know that they're t they're sighted most often offshore but uh, but they don't contribute to the map really uh, harbor porpoise and other species uh, special concern uh, the toothed um, low meta relatively low metabolic rate um, compared to some of the others sort of similarly sized cetaceans at least the nearshore shallow water species, uh, the diet includes small schooling fish, squid. If you do tour the aquarium on, uh, on Friday, go and have a look at Jack and Daisy, the two rehab harbor porpoise here. They're really quite interesting animals. Um, I've become much more interested in them <laughs> over the last few years, I have to say. Um, their site fidelity is, is moderately high, um, and, uh, and they're sort of at a medium trophic level, if you like. And these are site, this is a record of sightings of harbor porpoise in this area. So you can see the southern, the southern Gulf Islands and are a particularly good place to see uh, harbor porpoise. And then finally, oh no, not finally, two more, stellar sea lions. Um, this is a, a species that's well known. Its, it's uh, population trajectory is fairly, uh, is positive in, in, uh, in BC and has been for many years, but it's endangered. It, it suffered a tremendous depletion in Western Alaska for reasons that still aren't entirely clear starting in the 70s and continuing to, to very recent years. Um, and partly for that reason, it's, it's endangered, uh, it's listed as endangered. Uh, I mean, it's listed as special concern here in BC. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously, pinnipeds are toothed animals. They have a moderate, moderate 
Stellars have moderate metabolic rate, the coastal uh, distribution. Uh, they're opportunistic feeders, quite a, a, a varied diet, and uh, non-migratory. And then finally, sea otters. Um, listed now as special concern. They were downlisted some years ago. Um, very, very strong uh, uh, rate of increase post, uh, post the reintroduction that I mentioned in the 1960s. They have no blubber. These animals rely on, on very dense fur that they fluff up, fluff up with air for insulation. They have very, very high metabolic rate. Uh, Non-migratory, obviously living in shallow water, and their diet, they eat prodigious amounts of shellfish, sea urchins, uh, you know, tasty macroinvertebrates, basically, and very high seasonal site fidelity. So that's, um, that's my very quick and dirty um, survey. And, um, oh, finally, a map from Linda Nickel at DFO in Nanaimo. I was kind enough to send this over yesterday. And this shows the uh, uh, a recent uh, changes in the occupation of the coast by, by sea otters between uh, uh, over the last five or six years. The, the range has continued to expand. The um, original releases were south of the Brooks Peninsula off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And you can see that the, the, how this population is, is re-inhabiting the coast. It's, it's quite remarkable, really. So conclusions, marine mammals are diverse in BC, obviously. Um, many species are at risk. Sh some shared traits, I didn't mention that, it, that most marine mammals have, have relatively high longevity compared to, to many terrestrial mammals um, and high trophic status. And this predisposes them to certain kinds of contaminant risk, and, but variation in other traits, um, including their distributional uh, traits, suggests that both exposure and susceptibility to contaminants will be and should be, and from current evidence, is highly variable across this group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lance. Um, I think we have time for one question from the audience. Any burning questions? The, the question was in the picture of the two two male killer whales, the brothers. Which one was older, the fat one or the thin one? And uh, the thin one was older, um, not not uh, about six or seven years older. Uh, they're both within the the thin one is that it is of an age when killer whales start typically start to drop out of the population when mortality does increase. So so certainly his condition could be age related in some way as well. That's a good point. Thanks, Lance. I think we'll uh, move on. Um, my name is Peter Ross. I'll give you a brief overview of ocean uh, pollution threats to marine mammals, building on uh, Lance's uh, great overview of uh, the nine marine mammal species that are uh, listed as at risk under the terms of uh, Canada Species at Risk Act. Um, and in order to do this, I've been uh, assisted with, uh, uh, to a great degree uh, by Juan Jose Alava, who's in the audience somewhere I can't quite see, um, and, as well as a number of other people over the, the many years. There are actually some other people in the audience that have worked on uh, some of our marine mammal projects in the past. So when we think about marine mammals, as we've heard from Lance, we, we, we think uh, inherently of uh, a multitude of species, uh, different behaviors, different feeding ecologies, different uh, body uh, morphologies, different distributions. That makes it a pretty complicated uh, picture. And then we enshroud or, or envelop uh, these uh, species with 100,000 chemicals, uh, plus or minus, on the Canadian market uh, or the US market. Um, estimates of up to 250,000 chemicals on the global marketplace. Uh, it's very, very daunting to try to figure out how we get a handle uh, on the risks uh, that are out there, uh, and then to understand where we should be uh, placing our effort in terms of solutions. But this this is what we're going to try to do uh, today and beyond, is to try to figure out how we can uh, describe these risks, prioritize these risks, and then move forward by uh, targeting solutions that answer to these risks. And I think, uh, I think it'll be uh, fun, uh, but uh, uh, has obvious uh, challenges. Um, and when we think about marine mammals, uh, we heard from Lance, uh, we, we think about uh, often about long-lived creatures, uh, some of them very high in the food chain, some of them low in the food chain, some of them small, some of them big, some of them with blubber, some of them with 
fur. Um, so lots of body types, but we also know from numerous studies around the world, some of them regionally, some of them uh, internationally, uh, that marine mammals tend to be at risk to different types of pollutants as a, as a consequence of acute exposure in the case of oil spills, for example, with Exxon Valdez and the sea otter, the unfortunate sea otter in the middle here, but also lo long-term chronic exposure to some of the endocrine disrupting compounds uh, and many of the higher trophic level uh, species that accumulate these uh, compounds. So when we're trying to act as responsible citizens and stewards in the transboundary waters uh, in the Salish Sea, that's Washington State, British Columbia, we're talking about shared species that know no uh, boundaries, they, they swim around, their prey often uh, or food moves around with ocean currents or, or with life history. And we've got over 7 million human beings living in the watershed. Over 7 million human beings to uh, just under 80 individual southern resident killer whales, which is a species of tremendous concern in these shared, shared waters. So we've got 100,000 humans for every single resident killer whale. 100,000 humans, one resident killer whale. Uh, astounding when you actually think about your actions as an individual, when you're washing your hands, brushing your teeth, cleaning your sink, or flushing the toilet, or taking pharmaceuticals, when you think about all of the actions that you might uh, take every day, multiply that times 100, and, uh, and think about the down, downstream connections and implications for something like a resident killer whale. Big challenge. The one class of chemicals that tends to emerge to the fore when we think about marine mammals are the persistent organic pollutants, uh, notably the legacy compounds. These would be the ones that, that have been banned or, or largely uh, removed from the marketplace. PCBs, DDT are two classic examples. Uh, but these are compounds that are persistent for probably hundreds of years. They bioaccumulate in, in uh, organisms and, and uh, amplify in food webs. And they're toxic, meaning they're endocrine disrupting. They can look like thyroid hormones or estrogen or many other natural hormones. Therein lies the problem for, uh, uh, in terms of disrupting the health of marine mammals and other exposed individuals. Dioxins and furans were never produced uh, intentionally, but they were byproducts of pesticide production. The use of chlorine in the pulp and, and paper uh, mills until the late 1980s, and also uh, um, a byproduct of low temperature com combustion incineration, basically. So there exists to this day a legacy threat associated with many POPs, notably the PCBs. So we worry about that. We worry about the implications, especially in long-lived creatures. And uh, when, when we and others uh, found that the resident and the transient killer whales uh, in, uh, in this region, the Northeastern Pacific, uh, were the most PCB-contaminated marine mammals in the world uh, now 14 or 15 years ago, uh, it was a little bit of a wake-up call. It served to remind us that long-lived species at the top of the food chain are notoriously vulnerable to chemicals that have three properties, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And those are the features uh, that have been brought into the Stockholm Convention uh, that has uh, since provided an international regulatory framework for nations to uh, eliminate uh, the PLPs. Those are the legacy PLPs. But we still have a problem today associated with these chemicals at the top of the food chain, uh, notably in the northern hemisphere. Um, and that includes a lot of marine mammals, a lot of seabirds, and a lot of uh, aboriginal communities that rely very heavily on seafoods. We've also got the emerging POPs, or the emerging chemicals that have those same three properties, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. Uh, these would include things like the perfluorinated compounds, Teflon, uh, and, and various, um, various um, compounds that are used uh, in a variety of products. Um, we've got flame retardants like the PBDEs that are, 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 are pretty much getting phased out today. We've got hex hexabromocyclododecane that uh, is now very much under the watchful eye of regulators around the world. That is uh, uh, very commonly used as a flame retardant in that blue building foam. Uh, and uh, so construction materials. So we've got a lot of compounds that still retain those, those problematic features, 
uh, and present a risk to the top of the food chain. In fact, Derek Muir and, and, and uh, colleagues uh, did a review of uh, the uh, Canadian uh, domestic substances list, included there were over 200 compounds on the market today that, uh, that should be reevaluated in the context of those properties, persistence, bioaccumulative nature, and toxicity. So there are still uh, some chemicals out there we should be watching, uh, particularly uh, as they present a risk to the top of the food chain. And here's a good example that brings the two tales of divergent chemicals with very similar properties, but very different regulatory responses. PCBs on the left are down uh, over five-fold over the last 30 years in the transboundary, in harbor seals in the transboundary waters of the Salish Sea. Uh, regulations enacted in Canada and the States in 1976, 1977, uh, and consequently we see a, an improvement, a tremendous improvement in, uh, in mm, the PCB uh, contamination, shall we say, of a number of creatures. Harbor seals, wonderful canary. They're eating about 25 different species of fish and invertebrates. They provide a really good overview of the state of the local food chain. They're also food for those Biggs killer whales. So Biggs killer whales are not only getting more harbor seals, they're, all, they're getting cleaner harbor seals today from a PCB perspective. PBDs, on the other hand, only over the last few years have we started to see a phase out, uh, or withdrawal or regulatory of these compounds. They were doubling every three years uh, until very recently. Um, and, uh, and so they're, they're sort of a, they're good news, bad news stories to both of these questions, but PBDs will linger in uh, wastewater effluent because PBDs have been very extensively used uh, in consumer electronics, furnishings, etc. So it's going to be a long time, I think, before we get PBDs out of the waste stream um, as a result of their widespread use. Hydrocarbons. Uh, for anyone who is unaware, the motor vessel uh, Marathasa uh, spilled into English Bay. That's the top uh, right photograph here. On April the 8th, uh, estimates uh, put the spill at a very modest uh, uh, 3,000 liters. My guess is it was uh, a fair bit more than that. There's more work ongoing to, to try to characterize the nature of that spill. Um, but that's a very visible uh, hydrocarbon uh, point of entry into the environment. But what we often fail to realize is that there are, there are thousands of sources of hydrocarbons in our local environment. There are natural sources, including plant uh, byproducts, geological seeps, uh, forest fires that produce hydrocarbons that end, out, end up in, in, uh, into our coastal waters and uh, either food webs or sediments. We've got human sources, including uh, fossil fuel combustion, uh, leaks, uh, spills, and urban runoff. Um, and we really should think about hydrocarbons sort of, to, uh, sort of two threat categories from a marine mammal perspective. The acute impacts associated with catastrophic spills, that's the thing none of us want to see. We don't want to see those pictures of oiled sea otters or oiled seabirds on the front of the newspaper. That's just an awful story to tell. And th these are unpredictable, catastrophic events that, uh, that we, we have a great deal of trouble mitigating post hoc. We're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about that today uh, because I think we should be cognizant of the fact that we've got a lot of other sources of hydrocarbons. Uh, and some of these present chronic localized impacts to the bottom of the food chain. And for this example, I'll go to uh, Kate uh, Logan's uh, master's work uh, looking at hydrocarbons in uh, sea otters and their habitat on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Three bar charts here showing you histograms for PAHs in, in sediments, in their food in the middle, uh, and in uh, sea otters on the top. So what we're showing are sea otters eating a great deal of food. They eat 25% of their body weight a day. It's mostly invertebrates, so huge consumption. Uh, and even if they're exposed to fairly low levels of hydrocarbons in uh, their food supply, they're eating so much that uh, they, you can actually detect them in, uh, in circulation in blood. So that's a, a, a creature that goes down, uh, interacts with the sediments, feeds on invertebrates, of course, we know it to be inherently vulnerable to oil spills at the surface, but this is another way for them to get exposed to lower levels chronically to hydrocarbons of natural and uh, human sources.
Antifoulants, um, there are lots of ways to keep your, your boat uh, clean. Uh, mechanical means is the preferred route. It's, it's much more environmentally friendly. Copper sulfate and, and other uh, current use antifoulants are used extensively. Uh, organo tins were used very extensively uh, internationally on large vessels and small. Uh, they've since been uh, 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 sort of removed largely from the marketplace, but they still do linger on a lot of large uh, vessels, uh, particularly from uh, international destinations where the regulations were a little bit slower. Uh, and they're also very persistent. So they can be found in the sediments in harbors. Very persistent. They do accumulate uh, in food webs. Um, and, uh, but we have very, very little understanding uh, of their presence uh, in uh, local marine mammals. Currently used pesticides, we tend to think of uh, the new age, uh, the new generation of pesticides as um, having features that are more water soluble, they're less uh, persistent, they're touted as less toxic. And so what this means is rather than having DDT and dieldrin and endosulfan uh, sort of being persistent and bioaccumulating and getting up into the top uh, of the food chain like the like the PCBs, we've got these chemicals that really don't amplify in the food web. They, they mobilize more readily into uh, aquatic ecosystems. Some of them are very persistent. Uh, and uh, there are studies uh, in BC uh, in salmon and Washington State uh, in salmon showing that these water-soluble pesticides that are currently used uh, can affect olfaction, that's ability to smell, ability to find your, your natal stream, uh, ability to avoid uh, predation uh, in, uh, in streams, um, and other effects, including effects on the immune system. So there have been impacts, as do, impacts documented uh, to salmon uh, in freshwater environments. Environments, and this is a, a little bit troubling when we've got intensive agroforestry uh, activities uh, in uh, Lower Fraser um, uh, River and Estuary and a lot of the other salmon bearing uh, watersheds. Um, and um, uh, just to point out here that Ontario and Quebec have had bans, for example, on the cosmetic use of pesticides uh, for quite a while. Quebec, I think, over 20 years. Ontario, uh, more, much more recently. Uh, it failed to pass in British Columbia. Um, but it's something to consider. Um, because uh, these cosmetic applications are, it really means they're, they're not, there's no end game other than to have a pretty yard. Um, so it's one way in which we can work with homeowners to make sure that we're protecting the urban watershed and, and some of the non-point sources of, of these uh, pesticides into, uh, uh, into waterways. Uh, we have over 500 herbicides, insecticides, and fungus, fungicides routinely used here in British Columbia. Pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, not a lot of data for BC and Washington. Some have been detected uh, in, uh, in different marine mammals and different populations of the world, surprisingly, because we tend to think of most pharmaceuticals and personal care products as water soluble, they biodegrade, uh, you know, we, we don't expect to really find them in the environment because uh, we're not, we don't think we're using a, a, a large amount of these things. But when we look at point source discharges associated with different levels of uh, sewage treatment, we do find uh, hundreds of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. These could be antibiotics, they could be antidepressants, uh, they could be um, uh, 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 sunscreen, uh, other products that we're use, using in household. They could even be, uh, we also would include in this category natural hormones coming from our, our own bodies that we flush down the toilet uh, with, our, with our domestic waste uh, supply. So there are lots of ways for pharmaceuticals to get into the sewage uh, um, uh, treatment process. Many uh, people in the room here today dealing with the consequences of that, trying to document pharmaceuticals, personal care products in the sewage stream and what levels of treatment do what to what chemicals uh, and what that ultimately means to the marine environment. So this is one uh, that I would characterize as potentially of concern in some vulnerable receiving environments, typically in the smaller uh, freshwater areas. Uh, for example, in the UK, widespread feminization of a couple of species of fish in areas downstream of sewage uh, effluent uh, um, facilities. And that's because of the estrogenic nature of sewage. Uh, that's from natural hormones, artificial hormones, and a lot of other uh, products and byproducts of uh, human uh, households. Metals we tend to think of as uh, not terribly troubling at the top of the food chain, other than methylmercury, that's the H 
G, CH3. Methylmercury bioaccumulates the food web. It's a problem. We hear about it in tuna and swordfish. We worry about it from a human health standpoint. Most metals are going to be more of a problem at the bottom of the food chain uh, where they, they can be filtered uh, by uh, filter feeding uh, shellfish or crabs uh, and uh, fish. Plastics and debris getting a lot of attention today. Let's categorize these as macroplastics. This could be uh, derelict fishing gear or garbage versus microplastics. And the microplastics could be primary or secondary. Primary being, you know, the facial abrasives and uh, toothpaste uh, abrasives that uh, that are often added to products. Secondary being breakdown products. These could be from textiles or agriculture nets, etc. And these uh, microplastics and microplastics are increasingly recognized as a significant threat to the world's oceans in different ways. And we're worried about the structural impacts to blocking GI tracts or entangling different species. For example, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, Wendy Sanislow has been working to document 300 individual stellar and California sea lines that are currently tangled in packing straps, uh, plastic uh, rubber bands, and, uh, have, and or have fishing lures in, in their mouths. Over 300 individuals, known individuals, uh, we estimate over 1,000 stellar and California sea lions currently entangled with debris and macroplastics. This is a huge problem. Uh, so we've got to figure out where these things are coming from because poor Marty Helena heading off to uh, um, anesthetize and, uh, and save a single individual animal takes a lot of work, a lot of money, and can really only realistically be done for a few individual animals. Much more effective deal with the source of that debris. Let's back up here to the theme of the day. How do we take those various categories of priority pollutants and wrap them into uh, an exercise wherein we can understand their sources, understand their potential risk to marine mammals, and then have a forward-looking, practical approach to protecting marine mammals. One way in which I would suggest we try to do this is by categorizing marine, mammal, marine mammals into three uh, sort of uh, topical areas, one being top of the food chain, high trophic level, such as the uh, Biggs killer whales or the resident killer whales, low trophic level, such as humpback whales or gray whales or fin whales, or sea otters, or marine mammal prey. And we put marine mammal prey in there because there are a lot of marine mammals that are, are, are vulnerable to fluctuations in their prey. And if we have any pollutant impacts that affect the supply of food to any of our nine species of marine mammals, then that could be an indirect way in which contaminants are affecting that marine mammal. An example would be if there is a, um, if Chinook salmon are impacted by the forestry uh, industry's application of a pesticide or two, uh, then that's of concern from, uh, from the perspective of the health of killer whales. So when we go through our pollution solution categories, try to remember these type, these categories, these sort of uh, conceptual um, uh, bins, if you will, uh, as we derive solutions that will answer to the, the problems. The second level that we like to think of you um, sort of working through this, uh, this uh, problem is to consider five operational categories. Gone are the days where we make a list of chemicals, submit it to Ottawa or Washington DC or Brussels and say, ban this chemical, it's bad. That still happens. But we've also got to recognize that a lot of currently used uh, chemicals that are on the market and a lot of our own activities uh, here locally uh, can release these pollutants, uh, many pollutants into the environment. So for the sake of this uh, today, I'd like you to think of urban sources of pollution, home and garden sources of pollution, shipping and harbor sources of pollution, industry or point source discharges, uh, agriculture and forestry, all of these five operational sectors as potential areas where we can target different types of chemicals within each of those categories and then potential solutions within each of these categories. Because within each of these five operational sectors, we can envisage pollutants being uh, created or released or by-produced. We can also think of activities within each of those sectors that can actually stem the flow of those very same contaminants. So we've got both sources within these sectors, and we are all party and privy and members of each of these sectors in our daily life. Uh, and we've also got the solutions uh, that I'd like you to be um, brainstorming on today. 
So can we actually design solutions uh, for, for these contaminant classes within each of these five general operational sectors? Um, and can we do so in a way that, that we believe, or, or we can, better yet, we can demonstrate will lead to concrete uh, 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 protection of these nine marine mammal species? And I think if we look at it that way and we bring this home and we look at the community that we have in our audience today, then we're talking about the solution beginning right here uh, in this room today uh, and tomorrow. And for those of you uh, online or taking this message home, uh, the, the, the question, the challenge to each of us is, each of you is, what can I do to help uh, stem the flow of uh, pollutants into the marine environment? And why do I think that's, uh, that's going to help? And I think back to what Carlene Thomas said, we are really part of the ocean. We have to look at us as intricately linked with our activities and our existence to the ocean, to the health of the ocean, and ultimately to marine mammals, as well as safe traditional foods uh, for Aboriginal communities. So uh, thank you very much. Is there a question before we move on? No questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a five minute break. Uh, that'll allow you to stretch, uh, get a glass of water, um, but be back in here in five minutes because we're going to be uh, starting up again uh, very, very quickly. So thanks for your time. Uh, keep thinking, uh, and the next steps is going to be very much up to you. Uh, we're returning here in five minutes for the two final plenaries this morning.
strange pollution. Is that a thing anymore? Or? Mm, no, I mean, I, I don't I don't know why. I don't know about anything. We're trying, they're still trying to build me We're just on the verge of um, renting, leasing. I mean, as far as the tissue here, okay. I mean, is that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no sense of any of this burden in the marine mammals is coming from well, Asia. Uh, if everyone could take their seats. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
All right, folks, uh, welcome back to the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, we're into uh, phase two of our plenary this morning uh, and uh, delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Gobas from uh, Simon Fraser University uh, to talk to you today about the world of chemicals. Well, thanks very much, and thanks very much for inviting me to, to talk to you. Um, Peter asked me to talk about the world of chemicals. Um, not a minor task, so um, I'll try to do my best and give you some insights uh, into this enormous topic. Um, oh. Well, of course, there are many. There are many chemicals. Um, roughly about 11 million chemicals are known. Of that, about 100,000 are used in commerce. Um, these are some examples. 84,000 chemicals registered in the US. In Canada, all our chemicals of commerce are listed on the domestic substances list. There are 23,000 of them. And that was a 1999 list, so it's a while ago. Uh, so there's more. Um, in the Europe, where they're starting this exercise of, of, of um, accounting for all of their chemicals. They're now at 13,000, but there are another 50,000 dossiers, as they call it, that are ready to be ending up on, on these lists of, of, of registered chemicals. Now, of those chemicals, about 5,000 of them are, are produced in very large quantities, greater than, sorry, uh, greater than um, about a ton a year. And these are the HVPs, or high volume production chemicals. Um, new chemicals registered in the US, roughly 12, 100 to 1,500 per year. Um, in Canada, it's a little bit less, about 800. And then when you start looking at sort of what we know about chemicals and what we do about chemicals, how we manage chemicals, the second part of the, this list, you know, we have about water quality guidelines for about 147 chemicals in Canada. Um, Stockholm Convention lists 21 persistent organic pollutants. Uh, chemicals with illegally enforceable standards, I'm not talking about guidelines. Um, this is for foods mostly in Canada, about four, uh, four, sorry, 14. Now when you're looking sort of at our, at, at our business here, talking about marine mammals, uh, chemicals with tissue residue guidelines for the protection of wildlife consumers of aquatic biota, like, like our, uh, our whales, for example, um, well, there's really six chemicals that have that information. And then actually, to my surprise, um, I looked also up, you know, I was ch getting ready for this presentation, looking up, checking my numbers, virtual chemical elimination list. Uh, the most recent one, two chemicals on that list. I, I, I hope I'm right on this one, but I think I am, and I checked it all the way down to the source. So the point is not, of course, the, the exact numbers, it's the message in the numbers that there's many chemicals that, um, that are of potential concern at least, and in terms of how we deal with them, you know, we, we are at the beginning of things to, to say the least. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of managing, controlling um, chemicals. And of course, we know that chemicals are associated with a large number of, 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 of issues, environmental problems, ozone depletion due to CFCs, global warming, acid rain, eutrophication, fisheries closures, mortality in various species have been linked to very specific chemicals. There are very nice studies done um, linking, for example, the, the, um, the levels of dioxin to lake trout mortality in Lake Ontario, for example. Beautiful, beautiful study clearly showing the links between chemicals and, and major effects in the environment like mortality, endocrine disruption, as Peter discussed, many chemicals um, that, that are, are uh, believed to, 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 um, to, to cause this problem, uh, wildlife impacts, PCBs, dioxin, neonicotinoids, oils, and so on. We all know the example. So we, we, we know that chemicals are associated with, 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 with major um, with major effects. Um, often in BC, we have, you know, we look at our door and we see a beautiful environment and we say, oh, these problems are not for us, they're not here, um, they're somewhere else. But of course, they are also in our backyard. And, and um, Peter's slide earlier just confirms that uh, killer whales of uh, British Columbia 
can be considered among the most contaminated cetaceans in the world. So this is not just a problem far away, this is really our problem here now. Um, regulations. Um, of course, there's a lot being done about chemicals, and these are some of the major pieces. This is definitely not all of them. Uh, internationally, the UN Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants has, has taken the lead on the international level, uh, really evaluating um, chemicals, many chemicals, and um, now, now there's about a list of 21 chemicals um, that are considered to be POPs, and there's various actions um, associated with them. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, in Canada, chemicals are regulated mostly through the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Um, there are other pieces of legislation as well, like the Fisheries Act, um, pulp and paper mill regulations and others. But the, the main um, legislation um, dealing with um, pollutants, sorry, um, Oh, no, I didn't make a big mess out of my slides, huh? Um, let me just go back. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, why is everything so big now? Um, something happened. Uh, you're on slide mode. Oh, sorry about that. I better not use this thing. Back. Just go a little back. Yeah. Perfect. Um, just, just to catch up here, other pieces of legislation dealing with chemicals in the U.S., the U.S. Toxic Substance Control Act. In EU, they have a new program, relatively new, it's called REACH. And in Japan, there's a chemical substance control uh, law. And there's, there's many other um, um, pieces of legislation as well. The good thing is they all roughly do the same thing. Um, they evaluate chemicals for persistence by accumulation and toxicity. And Peter mentioned uh, these issues earlier, and they also look at, at risk. Um, so they basically follow a very similar approach, often using the same type of information um, to, to evaluate chemicals, in some cases really arriving at very different conclusions, which is, is worrisome in, in itself. So there is um, there's still a lot to be learned here. There's definitely limitations to this approach, and that's I think it's important to highlight here. Um, it's important to realize that the current regulations are really based on experience with organochlorins, like chemicals like DDT, PCBs, dioxins, and others that Peter talked about earlier. Um, they are often applicable, the regulations here, to water respiring organisms. So, for example, regulations about the bioaccumulation deal with the bioconcentration factor, which is a ratio of concentration in the animal and that in water. Uh, but as a result, of course, we miss many, many species uh, that don't respire water, um, like the killer whales that we talked about earlier. Toxicity information is often toxicity information for small fish, small invertebrates, but not, of course, for mammals, larger species. Um, we have to keep that in mind. The toxicity experiments that we use for evaluation are often uh, involve relatively short-term experiments. Of course, we know our killer whales live very long, um, so we're, we, we have a, really a disparity in terms of looking at the to toxicology here. Um, the toxicity tests often include a very limited range of responses, like things like mortality, growth, uh, fecundity. They're sometimes relatively easy to measure. More subtle effects are, are much harder to measure, um, therefore often not really used in these, in these evaluations. Um, all our evaluations and assessments are done for single chemicals, and of course we all know um, that is a, an enormous simplification. Um, organisms are of course exposed, uh, exposed to, to many chemicals all at the same time. We also have, um, in my feeling, um, um, a problem that we may miss many chemicals of concern. Because of our focus on PBT, we, we miss chemicals that may not be PBT, but that can still cause effects. Any chemical can cause an effect. It doesn't have to be PBT. And, and that, is, that, is, that is a pity in a way, because my feeling is that many chemicals that are not PBT can still be problematic. In many cases, food web biomagnification is, is ignored as a process. It's not included in the evaluation um, um, of, of, of really of, of, of any regulation to date. Um, Uncertainty is often ignored, and this is just getting at the, um, the bare essence of the limitations of these regulations. 
There are actions, which is good. There are things like production bans, uh, import bans, use restrictions. Uh, in Canada, also, there's a requirement to develop environmental quality guidelines that can help in managing many very um, number of, of, of activities um, that some of us are, are really uh, associated with. And there is also a requirement uh, to do monitoring, which is all useful. However, um, if you wanted my opinion on this one, um, Many of these things are, are happening at a very slow rate um, because it's a very time-consuming process. Um, and this is sort of evidence to indicate that. You know, at, at this stage, we only have 21 POPs. There's 5,000 HVPs, right? So we, 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 are, we are doing the right things, but it's moving at a slow pace. It took, us, it took us in Canada seven years to categorize the chemicals, and that's basically to figure out which ones are PBT. And then the next step is really to decide how many of them are of risk. So of the 23,000 chemicals, we ended up with about 4,000 chemicals that are PBTs and that have to be further assessed. Well, it will take us many, many years to assess 4,000 chemicals. <sighs> 131 chemicals on the toxic substances list. Well, it's just the beginning. It's a very slow process. The number, the number looks, looks impressive, perhaps, uh, but compared to the number of chemicals on the virtual elimination list, right? That's really action, too. Um, look at the number of disposal at sea permits, which in many cases are, are dealing with chemical discharges that really shouldn't really be occurring, right? So we about 40, about 111 uh, in 2014. A monitoring is highly reduced or eliminated. We're all aware of that. Um, the, the cutbacks of, of, of recent years um, have really reduced our ability to monitor chemicals, um, which is really unfortunate. And um, we talked about guidelines as one of the things that we're doing as part of our regulations to, to, to manage. Well, in many cases, they are inadequate. Let me just show you a little bit of that. Um, we did a little study, um, was done by Jennifer Arblaster, a master's student in a program, and we basically looked at the sediment quality guideline for, for PCBs, one of the chemicals that Peter highlighted here. And this is the guideline right now. This is done by the CCME. It's also adopted by the province. This here is the value. And we basically asked ourselves in this study, well, how would the world look well, the world here locally, um, if the concentrations are actually at the guidelines and things are fine, right? So we did that, and in order to do that, we first of all had to figure out what the relationship is between the concentration of sediment and that in various biota. And in, in, in our field, we call that the BSAF, biota sediment accumulation factor, which simply is a ratio of the concentrations in the biota and those in the sediments. So what we did, or what Jennifer did really, is she compiled a lot of concentrations for PCBs at three locations, Vancouver, Strait of Georgia, and Victoria. And she did that for a number of species, and she determined these ratios. And as you can see, um, these ratios include a lot of variability because there is a lot of variability in the concentrations. Uh, some areas are more contaminated than others, and that's really what's, what's causing this, these, these substantial error bars. The other thing that you can see is that um, when you look at the different bars between the different, for the different regions, you can see that they're statistically more or less the same. Right? So that basically means that the relationship between concentration of sediment and then the biota, given the variability in the system, is roughly the same. The other thing that you can see is that the BSCF really goes up. Right? It, it's relatively low for, for blue mussels, but then when you go to orca whales, it's orders of magnitude higher. Right? So then we said, okay, uh, now we know these values and we know their uncertainty, which is not insignificant. Um, let's go and do the calculation and simply figure out what the concentrations in biota would look like if the concentrations in the sediments are at the guideline, right? But it's supposed to be safe. So we did that calculation. It's very simple. You take the BSCF that I just showed you, and I multiplied times that 0 0.02 number that I showed you earlier. And this is what you get. Um, so these are frequency distributions. Um, um, 
show the frequency at, on the y-axis. The concentration is on your x-axis. Note that the concentration range is quite large because this is a logarithmic scale. So this is a wide variability really representing the natural variability in these concentrations. And then what you can do, of course, is compare these concentrations to um, the, the, the Canadian PCB tissue residue guidelines for consumption by wildlife. So this would be applicable to our killer whales who eat fish, right? And the, the, the other bar below it um, is for, for human health, for human consumers. And then the little bars here or the little boxes here shows you the range of effects concentrations. So now what you can really see is compare these concentrations to these values. And what you can see, of course, that in many cases, um, the concentrations far exceed really what would be safe uh, for the consumption of wildlife. Um, salmon, for example, here, this is, this is an interesting one perhaps. Of course, the, the, the salmon bar, I hate to use this thing because I'm going to mess up my slides again. Oh, here we go. Um, oh, that's why backwards. Um, this, is, this is for salmon, so we're all interested in salmon because we eat it. So if, you know, this is the, the safe level for, for uh, wildlife consumption of salmon, and this would be human consumption of salmon, and even there you can see it can be, you can be above it. So she looked at this question a little bit more. She did what they call a human health risk assessment, or this is the hazard assessment. It's a very simple calculation, really. You find out the consumption rate, which is listed here for, for um, Native Americans and for First Nations people. Um, you multiply times the concentration I just showed you, and you divide it by the weight of the animal, or the animal, <laughs> the human being, um, which is about 70 kilograms, and then you take the reference dose, which is an EPA uh, established number used in, risk, in these risk assessments of this type for, for many years uh, by many people. So the calculation is quite simple, of course, and then you can sort of see what the world would look like um, if we're at the guideline value, right? Which is supposed to be safe. And of course, you can see in many cases, we're orders of magnitude above it, right? So it's, it's basically pointing out that these guidelines not really do the job that we think they, they do. And this is a similar calculation now using an excess lifetime cancer risk. Um, typically, we think this is acceptable. And you can see you know, how these numbers, in many cases, will be orders of magnitude above it. This will be for people who eat harbor seals. Um, there are indeed people that eat harbor seals. And you can see um, what the, the associated risk levels might, might look like. By the way, this is the concentrations right now. Um, this is what I showed you was a scenario. This is what the levels are right now. Thankfully, the levels are a little bit lower than what I just showed you, which, which is good. Um, however, in many cases, we can still see that these concentrations um, start to exceed. This is a good example. Um, for example, this is for crabs, um, still exceed um, 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 acceptable values for, f um, for um, mammals and other organisms that eat crabs in this particular case, right? Um, there's many examples here. I guess the good news is that in generally speaking, the concentrations right now tend to be below the values that's acceptable for humans, with the crabs perhaps being a little bit of an, of, of, of an exception here. This is how the concentrations um, look for, for harbor seals. The, the box is the effects range, and you can see the concentrations are right in the middle of the effects range. And in this case, it's even a little bit higher than that. And these are actual cal concentrations. These are not model predictions. Um, same thing, this is for orca whales. This is for clams, cod, salmon. Um, see here? Um, there's still a significant fraction of the salmon population above um, that value that's acceptable for, for fish-eating uh, mammals. Um, this is the current situation with regards to um, concentrations in orca whales in relation to um, um, possible effect levels, right? So you can see that we're definitely, um, there is definitely a uh, concern here. So conclusions. Um, what I've tried to illustrate here is that the current regulations for chemicals in the environment are, in most cases, um, well, inadequate, um, if you want to put it simply. They're implemented too slowly. Um, in many cases, they are behind the state of the science, um, and that uh, 
in particular applies to some of the new chemicals that we're getting interested in, the fluorinated ones, siloxanes, UV filters, and so on. These regulations do not deal with these chemicals very easily because the chemistry of these, these, these new chemicals is very different from the chemicals of the, uh, the chemistry of the older chemicals that we're familiar with and that we have studied for many years. In many cases, our regulations are not even consistent with our regulatory goals. Good example, Canadian Environmental Protection Act. The Canadian Environmental Protection Act is supposed to be preventative. The way we're assessing risk is by looking in the environment what the concentrations are and then comparing them to the toxicological threshold values. These concentrations are in the environment at the time that we do these assessments. This is not preventative, right? And that is something to keep, to keep in mind as, as well. They're poorly enforced, we all know that. Uh, we, all have, um, we all know what's going on right now. And in, in my view, they are often out of touch with public expectations. And that is something that I think that we all have to um, keep in mind, and especially looking forward, and then looking forward to our task today. So in terms of a path forward, um, these are sort of my, my best pieces of advice, uh, hopefully they're useful. Um, but you know, the first thing is really start to apply common sense and science. And um, that, with that, I really try to say that not all chemicals are problematic. So, and we know that because our science says that the, the dose makes the poison. So all chemicals have the potential, but it really depends on the amount that's there. And the amount and, and, uh, uh, wildlife and humans are exposed to, um, whether there is a concern or not, right? And in many cases, thankfully, there is not a concern. So that's the first thing to realize, that not all chemicals are problematic. But there are a number of them that are. And those are the ones that I think we should try to identify and see if we can find solutions. I think we should act now when possible. I think the lesson is from looking back at the regulations is that the regulations are doing a good thing. They're moving us in the right direction, but it's moving way too slowly. So I think there are th things that we can do now um, that we should do now that are allowed to be done and that will be consistent with the regulations um, and that we can take action on. And I think that's one of the purposes of this meeting, is to try to identify in those cases where we can take action right now, right? And I think that's perhaps the way of, of, of the future. There's really no need to wait. We can take action now. Um, we, we're often used to expect you know, the government to, to do things for us. I think we're moving into a different world now where we're much more dependent on our own actions. And to a certain degree, that's, that's good. Um, many small actions can lead to significant changes. And I think that's hopefully uh, a, a, an encouragement to, for, for what we're trying to accomplish today. Uh, I think there are many examples of that. Um, the other thing is apply the science of today as much as you can. And then finally, I think we should just do it, right? And with that, I hopefully I gave you a little bit of a flavor of what's happening in the world of chemicals, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you. No, they're from wild animals. Oh, uh, the, the question was, were the concentrations that I showed you, were they for, for, for farm salmon uh, or wild salmon? And the question is, no, not farm salmon, they were wild salmon. Yeah. Where does the current regulatory concentration of 0 0.025 kilograms or whatever it is per meter come from in relation to those two bars that you put up from Health Canada? Yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, so wh where, where does the, the, the original uh, well, sediment quality guideline come from? The question to that, or the answer to that is it, it was based on toxicological studies in benthic invertebrates, right? So a small organism at the bottom. The problem is that these chemicals biomagnify. So the, the concentrations in the, in the benthic invertebrates are relatively low. Top of the food web, it's relatively high. The amount the magnitude is orders of magnitude, right? So 
that shows you how the error that we're making. Your second question is, are these guidelines related? So does the sediment quality guideline relate to the tissue residue guideline and so on? And the answer is no, they're not related. They are de developed through a different process by different people with different objectives in mind. And they're not related and that's, that is a, a big limitation. Yes, very good questions. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we're turning the floor over to, um, to Dr. Joel Baker from the uh, Urban Waters Institute, um, Center for Urban Waters at the University of Washington. Joel, thanks. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and thanks for, he just said to me, look out for the cables, and I just tripped on the cables, so thanks for uh, the warning. It's like the regulatory actions, they seem to be a little late sometimes. <laughs> but thank you for the kind introduction and for the setup from the, from the previous speakers. Um, what I'm going to try to do is to talk a little bit about addressing the question of, now that we know there's, there's lots of different species out there that are at risk and we know that there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals, how do we focus the conversation? How do we focus the conversation down to what, what can we really do about it? And my work is really centered over the last number of years in asking the question, can we tell where the chemicals that are in the environment are coming from? Um, obviously, it's a complex story. It's, it's a, there's, there's, there's lots of different sources. There's lots of different types of chemicals. But can we um, develop techniques, models, uh, approaches to uh, allow all of us to understand better when you catch a fish and it has so many parts per million of something in it? Where did that come from? That's the question of the day. Oh, God. Let's see. So I'm going to give you a brief overview, and then we're going to get into um, talking about chemical tracers. So my talk doesn't have any pictures of any marine mammals because I don't have any pictures of marine mammals, um, and we don't work in that area. We're really chemists, and, we, and we're, the theme of, of, of my group is using man-made chemicals as tracers of environmental processes, and we'll, we'll review that. So here we go. Um, so you've already uh, heard from the others that there are thousands of chemicals in the environment and, and in production, and they come from many types of sources, ranging from things that, that we do uh, in our houses to things that we do in our uh, transportation systems, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we tease this all out? And as I mentioned, the, the goal here is really to have the conversation about how do we prioritize action? We cannot eliminate all chemicals from all sources in all places at all the time. Um, we, we need to be able to focus. So um, I, I, as, as, as I uh, tell my students, you always put your reference at the bottom of the slide. So I shamelessly stole this slide from Peter Ross um, this morning, about an hour ago, um, <laughs> just for consistency. Um, so, so here's the question, right? The question is, um, you know, with the limited amount of time and resources, um, where do we target our efforts? Is, is this really agriculture and forestry? Is it really an urban problem? Is it home and garden? Um, the answer, you won't. Know, surprise you to, to learn is it's, it's all of them to varying degrees, but what is the approach to, to kind of work our way through the, the, the question of how important are the different sources for each of the chemicals um, or mixtures of chemicals for each of the species? So that's what we're trying to do. So we're really all about fingerprinting. Um, there's two approaches to think about, you know, the, the, to address the question of how important are different sources. The, the first is what um, I've, I've called their mass balance inventories, where you can go and knock on every person's door and say, well, how much lead are you releasing into the environment today? And you write it down, and you go to the next door, and you, and you do that for all of the Vancouver uh, metropolitan area, and at the end of the day, you know how much lead is being released in the environment. Um, there's some uncertainty in doing that, of course, and there's a lot of work involved in doing that. But certainly, we can do chemical inventories, the toxic loading inventory in the, in, in the states and things like that. We can, we can do it on the front end, try to total up all the chemicals that are being produced and estimate how much is being released in the environment. And that's a valuable thing to try to do. Our approach is to take an op is the opposite, which is to go out in the environment, measure what chemicals are in the environment, and then ask the question, what, do, what does that chemical profile look like, and can we back out, using multivariate statistical techniques, can we back out what the loadings of different sources had to be in order to explain the profile of chemicals that we're seeing uh, in fish, sediments, water, air, uh, things of that nature. So it's really a fingerprinting uh, technique that we, that we employ. Um, and it turns out that we're, of course, we are not the first to do this. Um, uh, people have been using uh, materials released in the environment by man's activities for at least several hundred years. 
Um, but probably the, 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 the poster child for this was back in the, see the age of the audience. I have to assess the age of the audience. Yes, okay. So believe it or not, for, for the youngsters in the crowd, we used to launch uh, or we used to light off nuclear weapons um, in, you know, in the U.S. just to test them to see if they're going to work properly. Um, and this had a variety of geopolitical implications, but um, from a geochemical perspective, um, what it did was it released a whole bunch of really interesting radionuclides into the atmosphere. And it turns out most of what we know about how chemicals are transported globally and, and indeed the, the, uh, the global carbon models that now drive all the climate change predictions are, are direct lineage from these um, early studies done by Broker and others of C14 and other types of nuclides released um, from atmospheric uh, weapons testing. So releasing chemicals in the environment and then chasing them around and figuring out how the environment works is a, is a, is a, is a long uh, tradition in, in doing that. So that's how we got started. That's, that's kind of the big idea. I'm going to show you some work that we've been doing recently in Puget Sound. Um, and, and apologies for the, uh, the, uh, the southern flavor to this. I'll, I'll refer to this as Puget Sound, but of course it's uh, actually the Salish Sea. Um, our approach has been to begin applying new analytical techniques to measure a whole bunch of things that are in the water that are not necessarily threats to whales or to us or to anyone else, but are interesting as tracers of chemicals. And I'll give you one example and, and, then, and then show you some applications. Caffeine. Caffeine is everywhere. Um, about once a year, the Seattle news newspapers realize that somebody has measured caffeine in Puget Sound, and they call me and say, oh my god, there's caffeine in Puget Sound. Um, do we know anything about the health effects of caffeine? And I, and I usually say, well, what are you doing right now? <laughs> Look at your desk. Is it a Red Bull or is it, is it a coffee? So we know a lot about caffeine. We're not studying caffeine in Puget Sound because we think it's a threat to the environment, but it's a nice tracer of, of humans. Um, there's the, there's the uh, molecular structure up there. So if you go out into Puget Sound, as we do, so we're south of where we are now, um, uh, we have a volunteer uh, uh, citizen science program where we ask people to go out on a given day, and we do call this our, our snapshot sample. That everyone grabs a water sample, sends it to our lab, um, and we analyze it for a whole bunch of things. This is the data for caffeine. The message here is there's detectable levels of caffeine in the surface water throughout Puget Sound, on, and you can't read this, but on, on, on the scale of you know nanograms per liter of caffeine in, in, in the surface waters, higher near urban areas, lower in rural areas, lower as you get closer to the ocean, higher as you get you know, poorly flushed. Pretty much predictable um, spatial distribution of, of caffeine. So you, get, you can begin to get a sense of where the people live and where the discharges are by the, the spatial gradients in caffeine. Again, no great surprise there. And you can do a little bit of calculation and say, does this make any sense? So um, there's about 200 milligrams of caffeine in a cup of coffee. Um, we can ask the question, how much coffee would you have to drink to load up Puget Sound to you know, whatever concentration of nanogram per liter? Um, and it turns out it takes about a half a million cups of coffee to, um, to do that. And you think, well, that's a lot of coffee. What's the population of the Salish Sea? Seven million people. So we can do this without breaking a sweat. This is not that much coffee um, per, per, per capita. Caffeine is transformed in your body. Caffeine is transformed in sewage treatment plants, et cetera, et cetera. So not all of it makes it into Puget Sound, but it's not at all difficult to understand that you can get a nanogram per liter of, of a chemical that we use as heavily as we use caffeine um, in other consumer products. And it's no surprise as a geochemist at all to find these chemicals um, in, in, in Puget Sound. The other interesting thing about these chemicals is that we know very well that how they break down. Caffeine has been very well studied in human systems and mammalian systems, and we know it's transformed into uh, uh, another chemical called paraxanthine. Um, about 85% of the caffeine you ingest goes that way. Some of it gets converted into theobromine, um, uh, which is an interesting chemical, but that's also uh, the major, one of the major uh, ingredients in um, chocolate. So we can begin to tease out how much is in chocolate and how much is in caffeine, um, a story for another day. But the fact that we know that these chemicals transform into known products, we can look at the ratio to determine how long the caffeine has been in the environment or how, long, how much uh, it's, it's been processed. So looking at ratios of things, metabolites to parents, is an interesting thing to do as well. Um, let me throw another one at you, and then I'll show you some, some, some data for it. Um, this is one of our, our favorite ones. Again, we, this was first, so hopefully you recognize the upper, the upper um, uh, image there, uh, it's called uh, Splenda is the trade name. Um, Splenda is, um, in, in essence, chlorinated um, sucrose. So you can see the chemistry below the, the chemical on the left-hand side is, is, is sucrose. 
natural compound uh, in a fairly convoluted uh, synthetic pathway. You can add chlorine um, to, the, to the sucrose molecule, uh, sucrose molecule make sucralose. Sucralose is about 600 times sweeter than, than sucrose, um, so it's very, very sweet. But the key to it, and the reason that it's, 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 it's a, it's a non-caloric sweetener, is your body can't digest that chemical. It hits the, it goes through your digestive system, the microbes in your gut hit that and say, well, chlorine on sucrose, I don't, you know, we don't know what to do with that, we're not gonna do anything with it, it passes right through you. It also passes right through sewage treatment plants. There's, there's no effective metabolism, metabolic pathways available for degrading that compound. That's why it works, that's why it doesn't deliver any calories to your body, but that also means it gets released in the environment and is not degraded. So we find sucralose all over the place. And in fact, others have as well. There's sucralose detected in drinking water supplies in major cities in Europe. There's enough of it floating around now that it's been discharged in the environment, it gets picked up by the next town's drinking water supply, so coming out of your tap is it's pre-sweetened for your convenience. No extra charge for that one. Thank your, uh, your, your local government for sweetening your water for you. Um, here's a time series of uh, caffeine concentrations, uh, so time on the, on, the, on, on the x-axis, just to give you a sense of what this looks like when you actually do it in the field. So we go out and grab, this, these are data from a little body of water near our lab in the southern part of, of Puget Sound in Washington State. So caffeine concentrations uh, grab samples over time. You can see the numbers bounce around. You know, tens to 100 nanograms per liter of caffeine per, uh, per liter of water um, with some variation, but really most of that variation is probably driven more by the physics of the tides moving in and out than anything else. Um, the interesting thing is the blue dots are the sucralose concentrations measured in the same samples, and you can see that there's more sucralose in the water than there is caffeine. And this makes perfect sense to us. It didn't initially. The students freaked out when they first saw these data because there's a lot more caffeine in use than there is sucralose just by mass. There's 250 milligrams of, of caffeine in a cup of coffee and there's yeah, maybe a milligram or so of sucralose if you, unless you're really loading it up. So why is there more sucralose than caffeine? Quiz? Anyone? Yes? Excellent, yeah, good. So the caffeine degrades, sucralose doesn't degrade, so you'd expect in the environment, and the further you get from the sources, that you're going to enrich the water in sucralose relative to caffeine, but caffeine's degraded in sucralose. So we like to see these things, but this kind of confirms, it links the, what we know and understand about the chemical behaviors with the actual behavior in the environment, so that's all good. One other story. Um, uh, so of some recent work that we're doing. One of the other big questions that is out there, and again, this is a little bit distant from the question of marine mammals, but not, not, not so much, uh, I'll make the argument in a second, is what is, you know, so the question is, what is the source of bacteria to places like shellfish beds in, in, in the Salish Sea? As I'm sure you all know, shellfish beds are routinely, are often closed due to uh, bacterial contamination. Um, and then the finger pointing starts, uh, you know, what, what's the source of the bacterial contamination? We think we can use chemicals to fingerprint the sources of the bacterial contamination just as easily as we can use the chemicals to fingerprint the sources of chemical contamination. So we've, we've been working with local um, uh, public health departments in counties around the Puget Sound region um, where we simultaneously measure, collect water samples, they measure the bacteria, the E. coli, fecal coliforms, things of that nature, and we measure a suite of, of personal care products and other, and pharmaceuticals and other things to ask the question, um, where is this stuff coming from? Because we're reasonably sure that raccoons don't drink coffee, um, we're reasonably sure that humans don't take veterinary an uh, antibiotics, um, et cetera. You get the idea. These different animals, different processes use different chemicals, so we, but they all, they all emit fecal coliform. So, we can't just look at the fecal coliform and figure out where it's coming from, but we can look at the things that co-vary with that as well. Here's a, here's a very poor photograph of a pipe. This is a failing septic system in a rural county in, in the Puget Sound region. Um, the county health department knows that there's high levels of bacteria coming out of, this, uh, out of this pipe, so we collected water samples and we measured a whole bunch of consumer chemicals, pharmaceuticals, um, all the things that, that uh, 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 were, were spoken up in, in the earlier presentations. And I don't want to d dwell on this, there's lots, lots of details here, but the, the, the two points to be made is we're detecting a lot of different chemicals. Um, and it, they're ones that range from, I'll just read off some of them. So uh, acetaminophen, I think you all know about, is, a, is, a, is the pain reliever, caffeine, and it's metabolite phenanthrene. Uh, carbamazepine is an anti-seizure medication, pretty heavily prescribed uh, medication. Contanine is, a, is a, a degradation product of nicotine, so if you smoke in your house, we can detect that, um, et cetera. There's sucralose, you can see. Um, 
Notice we also measure things like atrazine. We don't find atrazine in, in septic systems, which is good because you shouldn't find atrazine in septic systems unless you're, for some reason, using atrazine in your house. Um, if you are, you should stop immediately. It's not really going to do anything in your house. But you get the idea, you get this, you know, the, chemi the, the chemical profile. And in fact, if you look at um, raw sewage, um, I'm sorry, this is, uh, uh, th these are summary data from a whole bunch of different uh, samples that were collected that were known to be, that had lots of fecal coliform in the samples. So these are impacted samples. And you can see there's a range of concentrations, but we can detect all these different um, chemicals and, and use them as fingerprints. So we can do this. Um, we can do this analytically, and this provides a lot of opportunity to ask really important questions about what are the sources of toxic chemicals. So most of these chemicals are not directly, well, some of them are, some of them aren't, but a lot of these, you know, the caffeines and vanillins and things are not, we're not studying them as, as, as toxics, we're studying them as tracers, but we can, we can uh, use this technique to ask the questions about where the toxic chemicals are coming from. Just a little bit of a backtrack, um, that was an abrupt transition, right? Um, good. This is halfway through the lecture, you went to an abrupt transition to wake up the students. Um, they wake up and think they're, they're in a different class. They slept through it. It's like, oh, God, we're in a different class. So the, the gentleman on the left um, actually invent, uh, invented the first, built the first telescope, as shown on the right. Um, and with that, you know, uh, you know, several people figured out that, the, in fact, that the Earth rotates around the sun. Um, using this analytical tool of, of, of the telescope. The observations led to the, to, to the finding. If we'd stopped there in this, what's the 1600s, 1500s, we would, you know, this, is, this would be the state of the art, right? In some ways, the regulatory work that Frank just talked about, we're kind of stuck, <laughs> we're, we're kind of here, right? We, we, know that, we know the POPs bioaccumulate, but we're not really put, putting them into regulatory. We're a little stuck. Um, fortunately, we didn't stop with that telescope, a very nice telescope, and you know, back in the day, we built this one, right? Hubble Telescope, 25 years old this month. Um, and rather than having that hand-drawn thing, now we get to do this. We get much, much better resolution. We can see things we could never see before because we're using better tools. And the, the, the final point I want to make is we now have better tools. I've been doing this as long as Frank. Frank's been doing this for 30 years, um, plus minus, right? Yeah, we've been chasing these chemicals around the environment for a long time. The, the analytical techniques that are now available to us in the last five or 10 years have exponentially increased our ability to, to measure things. This is a, called a quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometer. I'm sure that doesn't impress you at all. Um, but what, it, what should impress you is what it can do. So, and you can, won't understand this at all, but what this is showing, this, th these are water samples from Puget Sound. We can detect each one of those little lines is an individual chemical that's measured in this water sample. So now rather than measuring 50 or 100 or whatever, we can measure thousands and tens of thousands of chemicals in water samples. Now most of them are natural, some of them are degradation, but there's a lot of chemicals that are out there. We can now begin to focus on all the chemicals rather than, than, than cherry picking a few of the chemicals. I mean, this, is, this opens up a lot of potential, not only for fingerprinting, but also for be, being able to look at the metabolites, I suspect a lot of the, the toxicity we're seeing in the environment is not necessarily the parent compounds that we've been focusing on since the Clean Water Act in the US 40, 50 years ago, but are metabolites or conversion products or impurities of, of, of those things that we've been focusing on, we, we, we now can do that. The other thing which I don't know nearly much, as much about, but I have a, a new colleague at the university that's very, uh, that brings us some of these tools, is the ability to, you know, the, the whole omics field, the whole explosion, and, and the number that just blows my mind is, you know, the Human Genome Project took um, 13 years and um, spent 2.7 billion U.S. dollars to, to sequence the first human genome, uh, probably one of the major accomplishments in science in the last 150 years, um, and it cost about $100 million per genome. You can now have your genome sequenced, um, do a little swab and send it in. It's about, you know, depending on who does it for you, between $1,500 and $4,000 and takes about a month. Okay, that's 15 years of progress. We can now do environmental genomics. We can collect water samples and we can get the suite of, um, that probably means something. Yeah. Um, we, we can get the suite of genetic information. We can know what species are, are there. This becomes a big data problem. Sorting all this out is, um, is, is the challenge ahead of us. We're now telling all of our students and we're, we're recruiting students who understand statistics <laughs> because we generate a lot of data now. Um, but I think what I see here is a marrying now the, the, uh, the, the, the that means I'm out of time. Golly. Um, 
so I'll wrap up. But what, so microbial source tracking has been around for a long time, trying to figure out what microbes are out there, what's causing disease, what are the invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. That's always been over here. The chemical source tracing has been over here. And I think these are starting to come together. So my final slide, um, it just makes a couple of points that, that I kind of want to leave you with. Um, the first one is that this, this, what I call the source game is here, is really changing from being able to measure, or only being able to measure individual compounds. Um, so to measure 100 compounds takes you a long time. Um, we can now measure thousands and tens of thousands of compounds, and it, it, it really is going to revol it's in the process of revolutionizing the source tracking um, exercise. Um, Marrying those techniques uh, together with, with big data analytical techniques and geospatial um, approaches, which I didn't have time to say anything about, I think holds great promise for addressing that key question, where are the chemicals in the fish coming from? Um, we're still left with this cause and effect problem because we, we know that it, there's complex mixtures. In some ways, these new techniques just make that a worse problem because now we know that there are tens of thousands of chemicals and we can document them in the environmental samples, but, um, and we need to relate that back to effects. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm, there's some cause for optimism that, uh, that the new, new techniques are going to help us explain what, frankly, has been a lot of unexplained observations in the field in terms of toxicity. You, know, you see toxicity, you see biological impacts in the field, but the, you know, no individual chemical rises to a high enough concentration that says, oh, yeah, it's definitely you know, the lead's causing the problem. And um, you kind of wave our hands and say, well, it must be all of them. I, I think we can get better with, with the new techniques. So with that, I will thank you for your time and take questions if there's. Please. Is there a Canadian version of you? <laughs> I think he's standing right here. You know, this is this is all relatively new. I think there there are. Um, I, I don't want to name specific names because I think people are just kind of getting started in in this field. Um, but certainly, this analytical technique, most of which is most most of the analytical techniques are coming out of the pharmaceutical world, um, and there are definitely labs in Canada that have that capacity. The difficulty we're having, well, this is just an evolutionary process. Getting on our side, getting EPA to understand the potential of this has been really difficult because they don't understand the potential of <laughs> You know, it's just instead of going from single targeted, you know, they want to start with a targeted analyte list of, you know, some restricted number and go out and figure out what those chemicals are. This is a different approach. Um, so it, it'll take a little while for this to become accepted. Uh, but, you know, it's, there are labs that are, 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 are spinning this up now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Joel. Thank you all. Uh, this is going to conclude uh, this morning's uh, session of the Vancouver Aquarium. So thank you uh, online and live here uh, in the studio. Um, thanks for joining us. And thank you to all the speakers this morning for uh, presenting uh, the latest and greatest.